Good evening. My guest tonight does not want me to tell you that he's one of the most distinguished actors in the British theatre. He thought it best that I shouldn't bore you by rehearsing a catalogue of the credits that cover two whole pages in Who's Who. And it also covers 55 years on stage and on screen. So I will not embarrass him by doing so. I will simply introduce him as a man who roars around London on the biggest motorbike I have ever seen. Ladies and gentlemen, Sir Ralph Richardson. You've got, you've got a book with you. Oh, yes, yes. Don't, forget now. We mustn't for, let me forget that. That's right. very important. We're going into that later on. Now, have we got it right for you? Is it clean enough? Is it's it all right. Yes, it's, it's nice here. You've got a very nice place here, haven't you? Very nice it's place. It's a small indeed. place, but mine own. Well, it's a great deal bigger than my place where you came to see me the other day. But it's not as posh as yours. No, but you've got a lot more friends than I have. Look at all these people here. <laughs> There was no one at home when you came. You got a, they are very nice people. How do you know they're nice people? We haven't seen them yet. Are they friends of yours? <laughs> that side is. Or are they enemies? Well, we don't know. No, we don't know. Do you know whether they're friends or enemies? I don't know. Shall, 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 we, shall I address them? Are you good at... Well, you're good at this. Your I'll, job. I'll address them. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, <laughs> I assure you, ladies and gentlemen of the lad, I show you all that this gentleman, this, well, this man, Hearty, this man, Hearty, is innocent. <laughs> Whatever he may look, I leave it to you. I address you. I appeal to you. They seem all right, don't they? <laughs> well, I that's like that chap there. He's laughing. Right, right. Are you ready to talk a bit now about yourself? No, wait a second. And, of course, you, <laughs> you, you've got a lot more cameras than in, in your place than I've got in my place. Cam cameras really always make me rather nervous. Well, they're nice chaps. I know they're nice chaps. I know they're very nice chaps. I know some of them. You they're do? They're very nice chaps, but I, the, the camera itself makes me nervous. It sort of follows you about everywhere, doesn't it? You're used to it, I suppose. You don't mind. I'm still nervous by it. That one, that one is moving away from us at yes, this moment. Yes, it is. Yeah. They're like a lot of sharks, aren't they? They're sort of yeah. prowling on you. Have you seen... Of course, you know them. You, you probably feed them, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right. What do they eat? Celluloid and chips. <laughs> I say, look, look. This is a charming place. What, what a wonderful view you've got. <laughs> what a wonderful view. <laughs> I mean, you could see anything out of here, couldn't you? I mean, you could see the Tower of London, you could see Buckingham Palace, you could see the Post Office Tower, couldn't you? I bet you could. I can't see anything. <laughs> I'm sure you can. Well, now... Have I got, I've got my laundry list there. Yeah, I? you've got your laundry list, you've got your yeah. pipe and your tobacco. Yes. You've yes. got a chair waiting there. Yes. An audience waiting. Why don't you come and sit down? Now? All right, sir. All right, I will. I'll, I'll pull yourself together. I'll pull myself. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're a very severe man, aren't you? <laughs> of course, you were a schoolmaster, weren't you? You were telling me you were a schoolmaster. I was a schoolmaster for ten years, but I never had as difficult a pupil to deal with as, as you are going ah, to be, ah. clearly. Well... Why, well, 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 tell me, why did you become a schoolmaster? A friend of mine, a great friend of... <laughs> great friend of mine is a schoolmaster, Michael Croft of the National Youth Theatre. A distinguished man. Well, he's a, a schoolmaster. And I said to him, did you enjoy your school day so much that you wanted to be a schoolmaster? He said, absolutely the contrary. I loathe my school. I thought the masters were appalling, and the only reason I became a schoolmaster because I wanted to think there would be one good schoolmaster once somewhere. <laughs> he wasn't. He the wasn't. opposite. What? I, I had marvelous schoolmasters. Did you? Mm, I well, enjoyed being at school, and I wanted to get back into it as soon as possible. Except I was attracted by the bright lights and by cameras at a very early age, like about twenty. Uh, but all my family background taught me that you had to have a job with a pension. You see, you had to have something secure, hard, and long distant. I mean, you couldn't. So were be your parents? Did they were they in a long, secure, pensionable job? No, they weren't. They were. They worked in a fruit and vegetable stall on a market. <laughs> and they didn't have a pension for that. No, no, no. But they grafted a lot. And they, uh, I see. But they thought that, that was the idea. That was the ambition to have something secure. Yeah. Though they themselves were not secure. Absolutely. That's, That's what they wanted for me. So you see, I went to be a teacher because I knew when I was sixty-five. Uh, that I would have a pension and I could retire and have a little cottage and two grey yeah. greyhounds. Yeah. And look where I've landed up. Huh. But you haven't got a pension here, have you? <laughs> <laughs> I hope I have. Well, where, where did you go to school? The, well, Yourself. Where did you go to school? Uh, but then you, you were a very clever boy. <laughs> 
You are very clever, but because yeah, that, you, yes. you went you went to a university, didn't you? Yes. And but you you got a scholarship, as you say. Your parents weren't very wealthy people. No. They, you you fought your way, and you got a, that's a very clever boy, it must be. <laughs> very clever I'm not sure I'm as clever as you at this moment. What did you what did you what, what what degree did you get? In what did you get a degree? I got a degree in English literature. Did you learn and read it Anglo Saxon? Yes. Did you really? Yes. That's a terrible thing, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Do you know any? Have you ever seen it written? No, but my boy went to went to uh, a university and his Anglo Saxon used to bring it back to me and say, What are Absolutely terrible, terrible task. Very good for you, I suppose. Well, it sort of trains the mind, but it is a stiff training, an athletic training. You can learn Anglo-Saxon, my goodness. Did you go to university? No, I didn't. Do you regret it? Well, yes, I had no education at all, really. I was always ill. I was sort of professionally ill when I was a little boy. <laughs> <laughs> My first profession was a patient. <laughs> and I was really always ill and hardly ever at school. And I didn't like school at all, and they didn't like me, and we really got the worst out of each other. Well, when we've got out of school, but did you have stars in your eyes? Did you want to be a star at school? Oh, no. No, no. I wanted to bury myself at school. Uh, I was very bad. I was very well, bad, and everyone hated me. But I did have a very curious uh, uh, experience, which I do remember. <laughs> we used to study. We studied... Uh, literature a bit, very badly. But we did study Macaulay, The Lays of Ancient Rome. And I was the sort of dunce of the class. And they said, now, Richardson, could you uh, get up and read a, a verse or two? I don't suppose you can. Could, <laughs> could you? So I said, I don't know. <laughs> so they said, well, try, Richardson. Probably you can do something. <laughs> <laughs> so I got up and I read last portion of Clusium by the line gods he swore by the line gods he swore it da 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 dee da da <laughs> alone there la da da it frightened the life out of me <laughs> it frightened the life out of them they were horrified they were electrified it was very good but <laughs> I thought they said yes yes now sit down with it and they didn't have any more of that because the boys usually are all exclusive, you know, by the long gods he swore. I mean, that was the standard of doing it. But that I found that I had a knack for this reading. And, but it frightened me. I never read again. No one ever asked me to. <laughs> Do you find it easy to learn lines? Easy to learn lines? Mm. Uh, yes. Yes. I mean, as well as other actors do, which is a, a sort of knack. When I first started to act for some years, it was hell trying to learn them. But it, is a, it isn't as clever as writing shorthand, or, but it is a knack that can be found. I can learn as well as most of my profession do, I think. At this, at this moment, you are on the stage nightly yes. uh, in, a, in a pinter play called No Man's Land. Yes. Uh, w having watched it and been shattered by at the, it... At the National Theatre. At the National. At the National. Uh, this is very important. One of the reasons that I'm here, that I'm daring to step in the, this stage, is uh, on this stage, is because they were very keen for me to do this program because they said I could advertise the National Theatre. I'm a member of the crew, of the team of the National Theatre, and, of course, you're not supposed to advertise in these things, but since we're all shareholders in the National Theatre, the more I advertise it, the cheaper it'll be for you all. <laughs> so every now and again, if you don't mind, I'm going to try to take the opportunity of mentioning the National Theatre. Now, he's given me my first lead. Marvelous. E every time I say it, please, the National... We're well, not again now, but we'll try. Don't forget, a member of the National Theatre here to advertise. No, will, what it, will, will, it, uh, <laughs> will it underline it if they applaud every time you mention the National? They might, you know. The National Theatre wouldn't mind. They wouldn't? No, they'd like it. Well, you're being paid for it. Of course, I, well, yes, there is that too. <laughs> yes. But it, I, when I went to see the National Theatre production of No Man's Land, yes. apart from being a shattering experience, uh, it's not the kind of play which has a beginning and a middle and an end. No. And therefore, it, would, it seemed to me extraordinarily difficult for you to know where you were at any one point in the thing. Is, was it, is it a difficult play for you to do? Not in that respect of knowing how the plot goes. Well, there isn't any plot, but that never bothers an actor. 
the, the, the sequence of things, no. But it is, it, it's a plot, as you say, with no, no boundaries, and it has no... The characters are never really rounded off. They don't quite know themselves perfectly who they are, but it is in a form, in a way, rather natural, in a way we don't quite know who we are. We hardly know anybody else, really, completely. We none of us know when we're going to die. So we're all in this kind of plot of involvement and mystery to ourselves and to other people. And that, this, uh, this play that we're talking about is a, uh, a, 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 an attempt to at reality in a different level. How then do you guard... You have to do it night after night after night. How do you guard against boredom? Well, it's never boring, really, because it's so difficult. It's never boring in that way, and it's never boring because the audiences are never the same, and they reflect on us a very great deal. They alter, our, I mean, our punctuation in music, the punctuation is absolutely strict. The, uh, the bars, the rest bars in, uh, in music are absolutely defined. Now, our punctuation cannot be quite strict because we have to relate it to the, uh, to the reflections of the audience, and we are continually changing our score. We have to. And that keeps us on our toes, if nothing else. And the work is so difficult, that we, I think I certainly find, uh, that uh, it couldn't be boring. It only gets boring, perhaps, if one has succeeded in doing the work you do. You can, like finishing a crossword puzzle, when you finish it, it isn't the search to, for, for the completion of the pattern which we have in our work at the present time. I've played it, I think, now well over 100 times, 120 times, but I by no means solved the crossword puzzle for myself. I've never given a performance which I thought, well, I think I've found all the bits of that. And so that makes it non-boring. But of course it is. Uh, our work is a gr good deal of tram driving in it. And it does, it does have... A, well, a bus driver has to go down the same route. We do actually say the same lines every night. But uh, also what gives it a special fascination for me is a challenge with time. If you're a writer or if you're a painter, you paint or write when you... Well, you give or set yourself a task. But we have to do this task at a precise moment. At eight, three minutes past eight precisely, that curtain goes up. And acting, you know, is a make-believe, they say. You've got to pretend to believe. Well, no one will believe you completely unless you partly believe it yourself. And there's a great deal in our work which is making yourself dream. You've got to believe. You cannot believe the whole play all night, every time, but bits of it will restore your, your imagination to carry on to another little bit. So you have the task is to dream at eight, three minutes past eight, you must dream. You've got to start. And that is a... That keeps you alive, if nothing else. Do you dream when you go to bed? Yes, I dream a lot. <laughs> I dream a lot. And I have um, uh, some... I live a fairly sort of sheltered life, you know. Now that things are fairly peaceful in the world, nobody throws bombs at me at the, up to the moment. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody tries to murder me much, you know. <laughs> but uh, or no one's very... I don't... I live a peaceable life. But uh, in this part, for instance, that I'm playing now, there is a lot of horror in it. There are some dreadful thoughts. And fortunately, I'm able to remember my nightmares. They help me a great deal. And I think that um, I'm rather glad I have nightmares. I'm rather glad I can remember them. They help me in my work. Professionally, I'm earning money when I'm asleep, when I have a nightmare. What happens to you in your nightmare? Do you get clobbered at all? Yes, I do. I get murdered a good deal. I get stabbed quite a bit. Maybe that I was remembering someone on your program you had I saw the other day, they said in a reincarnation she thought she was an Egyptian princess. Well, I never anything like that in my dreams. I often get murdered, as I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> you, don't, well, you don't like your own body much, do you? No. No, not really. No. <laughs> I don't think anybody... Uh, do you like your... Do you like your... Turns? I like it, you know. I I'm mean, not talking about a pit. Um, Shall we swap? Bodies? Well, you don't like your face. I hate my face. Do you? I hate my name. 
I hit my body. I hit my body from the waist downwards. Oh, really? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't see anything the matter with you. You look fine to me. But I wondered whether you'd gone into acting because you weren't satisfied with your face or your body. I mean, whether, whether you actively made it a step to, to put some different character or persona Well, I on. think so, yes. There are lots of reasons that people become actors. Mm. Some to hide themselves and some to show themselves. But uh, some people think that they're so graceful and God has given them so many gifts that they wish to share them with other people. Other people perhaps want to disguise themselves. I don't like my face at all. It's always, I thought, been a great drawback to me. I've seen better looking hot cross buns than <laughs> <laughs> I am. But, uh, and yes, I don't know how it is. Were you happy to get into uniform in the war, for instance? Were you happy to be out and doing things that weren't requiring anybody to look at you uh, individually? Yes, yes. I really enjoyed my naval service very much. Did you volunteer for it? I did, yes. How old were you? Oh, well, I, goodness gracious, I must have been about 40 or something. I don't know, 35. Were you fit? Something. Well, very, yes. But I could, I could, uh, I was, I had a hobby of flying. I had an aircraft of my own. And when they, the fleet air arm wanted pilots that could fly, they didn't have to just train them from the, from the beginning. So I was useful to them. But I was very, I was so unhappy at school that when I did join up, because I thought, well, they wanted this job done and they rather wanted to recruit me, and I thought it was a good chance, because I thought the war was going to last a very long time, and uh, I thought I could get in rather nicely, rather selfish of me, but I dreaded it very much, because I thought they'd be as beastly to me there as they were beastly to me at school, but they were wonderful to me. They simply, they brought the best out of you by being so absolutely certain you've got the best in you. And, uh, but at any rate, I did my best, that's all. But did you, you, you got some rapid promotion uh, from, a, from a, a happy accident in a... In oh, a I was very successful in, in the naval service. First of all, I flew for a time, and then they weren't so keen to have pilots anymore, and so they said, who would volunteer? Could they send people up to the Admiral's office? And so I was selected to go to the Admiral's office, and I sat at the desk that was given to me from my predecessor, who left, that's why I was there. I was opening his drawers and I found some old tobacco things and a bit of old cigarettes and some pen nibs. I threw those away. And then I found a paper, a very mysterious looking paper, an office paper in the Admiral's office. And I didn't understand it very much. But I thought it rather, rather, looked rather interesting. So I initialed it. My initial in the, those days was S002. So I put it S002, that means that I decided that it was good, and put it in my out tray, and it went to the Admiral with my S002 on it. He was so pleased with it that he sent it to his boss at the Admiralty. And it went to the Admiralty, this scheme, and it went through, and the, in the end, this, this scheme was taken up in quite a big way. And so the Admiral came to me, he said, your, your scheme, Richardson, has been a very great success. <laughs> I feel I should, I should like to congratulate you. You've done <laughs> splendidly. And we would like to... I said, sir, I found it... No, no, he said, that's nonsense. <laughs> and so we have a little promotion for you. And so I had... The, but I, he'd never believe it. As a matter of fact, they, they asked me to a party here. They still remember me. I still can't. They say, too modest, too modest. <laughs> <laughs> So. In, in your long professional career, you've obviously been to many, many different countries to play, to play in front of different audiences. Oh, yes. Which is the happiest country you've been to? Well, <coughs> there's ways I've enjoyed them all. I, was, I do enjoy Australia, rather. Australia sounds rather a dreary place from the way we look at it. When you get there, it has very, very great charm. A wonderful charm. It's almost indefinable. It's like a woman that you love, and perhaps she's not so terribly pretty, not so terribly bright. Scenery isn't very, that I've seen isn't very dramatic, but there's a great charm about it. <coughs> They're funny people. They speak sometimes in a funny way. An example, example of that, I remember uh, someone from our company went out to tea after the matinee, went to the restaurant, took up the paper, and 
The waitress was standing there and he was looking at it. He said, Miss, how's the whiting? She said, there ain't no whiting. We bring it at once. <laughs> <laughs> do you like America? Yes, I do. I didn't like it to begin with. I've been there several times. I like it more, more and more as I go there. I wouldn't like to live there very much. Right, I wouldn't like to live anywhere except in my own country, perhaps. In Regent's Park? Yes, it's nice there. You pay the gardener. Mm. And, of course, it's not very far from the National Theatre. Before we, before we get lost inside the National Theatre, we have to take a slight break now. We'll be back in a minute or two to see you at work in that dreaded and dreadful but successful film, R Rollerball. Stay tuned for more about Rollerball, more from Ralph Richardson and more from the National Theatre. <laughs> Welcome back to part two in, in our uh, counter down the life story, or through the life story of Sir Ralph Richardson. You, we, I was talking at the very beginning of the programme before you appeared upon the screen about you as a, a motorcyclist thrashing, thrashing yourself around London. Yes, well. It's an odd sight, isn't it? Mm. Yes, it is. <laughs> I remember a funny thing happened to me on my bike the other day. I was going down by Hampstead Tube Station. I've been driving a bike all my life. I'm still trying to improve it. Not a very good driver yet. But uh, I went down to the tube station. The light was against me. I knew the light was against me. I stopped perfectly, dead on my white mark. I stopped next to the curb so that my left foot could rest on the curb. And a little boy came up to me about seven. He said, Mister? I said, Yes. He says, it's a very dangerous thing you're doing, mister. <laughs> <laughs> so I was amazed. So I looked again, I was dead on the line and the light was red. I said, I don't understand what you mean. You're, what, what, what's so dangerous? He said, you, mister, on that bike with that pipe in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and he's quite right, I never put a pipe in my mouth again when I'm on a bike. <laughs> but I wanted to ask you something. You've been at this job now for five, six years, haven't you, here? Very interesting job. What nerves you must have, nerves of steel. But, I mean, what's that? <laughs> well, mustn't he be? I mean, anything might happen, you know, but he, he's, he's a really a steady chap with those bright, intelligent eyes. <laughs> but uh, what, what I wanted to know was, you meet people from the theatre, like myself, you meet people from the church, you meet scientists, you meet politicians, every class and kind of mankind. I wanted to know if you had any kind of... What kind of people do you find easier to talk to? Are there any professions that you find easier to talk to or some that are rather difficult? Well... Who, tell me something about I, <coughs> that. On the, the, you're asking serious questions. Serious questions, yeah. yeah. I, uh, actors and actresses I find the most difficult. I can imagine that. You apart, of course, uh, because they are not as used as, as some of the rest of people are to, to, to act to talking without a script. No. Uh, people who do things like painters. There's a marvellous lady, old lady painter called Helen Bradley who, who volumes forth a lot. Old people, on the whole, are magical to talk to because they don't have to occupy a stance and they don't have to make any claims for themselves and they're in a kind of peaceful area. Yes. and don't have to prove anything. But, you know, I'm, I, it's still intimidating. You talk about nerves of steel. When I, when I approached you for the first time with a lot of trepidation, because, you're, A, you're taller than I am, and, B, more important than I am, in that order. No, the other order. <laughs> and I was very frightened of you, and I, I, it was like landing, landing a salmon. You know, you have to play it fairly carefully and mm. put a, a decent fly on the end of it if, if you're trying to hook Sir Ralph Richardson. And I have to tell these people here, and anybody who's watching, that uh, in order to impress you, uh, I tried to speak in a very posh voice <laughs> when I went to his house. 
And so everything got rather sibilant and rather sort of upmarket, and my vowels started to go that way. <laughs> um, and I find it very difficult to decide whether to say dance band or dance band or whatever <laughs> it is. And I was trying to impress you a lot by saying, of course, Sir Rafe, I'm very pleased to have you on the programme. And, and the nicest thing was, when I got to the end of an hour and a half with Sir Ralph, of me talking very posh, <clears throat> he took me to the door and clapped me on the shoulder and said, well, I might have a try at it. Uh, there's one thing which will uh, attract me towards you, is, is that of all the things you've done, you've never managed to lose your northern accent. <laughs> I like your accent very much. And I thought I was getting rid of it, flattening it as far down as I could go. But except, yes, old people, but uh, otherwise you wouldn't even know professions that you I like would people choose. who do things. I like mechanics. So, no, I like and... talking to people. I like talking to engineers very much. Engineers? Very much indeed. They're very precise minds. They work. They they build bridges or they make very accurate things. That their minds are very disciplined, and yet I find engineers have roving minds. They can talk about anything. I find them very easy people to talk to. I like my favourite people. I think that I haven't met so many are explorers and people that do that kind of people. potholders, potholders, and. Uh, I've met one or two people of that kind. They are a very brave people, and that makes them sort of attractive because they've conquered the... To be brave, to be... To choose to be brave is a great sign of character, I think. And they have great accuracy, and they have great fantasy. Otherwise, they wouldn't wish to climb higher than someone else or go deeper into the earth. And so I find them as a class very interesting people to talk to. That's only singling out two professions. <coughs> Is it true that, that, you, that you don't enjoy seeing yourself in films? No, I don't at all. Why? Well, I, well I've said about my face, I don't like it much. I don't like anything about it. I don't like to see it at all. So I never do really go to see myself on the film because it discourages me and puts me off for a long time and I, I lose confidence in myself. But I really lose confidence in myself when I've done a bit of filming in my life, not nearly as much as I have working on the stage, but of course I've never seen myself. But when I meet someone, they say, oh, I say... Richardson, how nice to meet you. And I must say, Richardson, I like you on the film much better than I do on the stage. <laughs> that really, I do lose confidence there. Well, we have a bit of cell you on celluloid here. It's ah, from, well. It's from a film called Rollerball. Rollerball, yes. Which is very new. Film. Yes, yes. I talked to the director, Norman Jewison. You did, week. yes, yes. Now, shall we have a little look at that? Well, you it, can. Well. It... <laughs> <laughs> I prefer the National Theatre. <laughs> This is, well, all right, you have to suffer this bit for our purposes. This is where uh, Jonathan E is the man's name, uh, who's the, um, the guy in the film who um, is the hero of the film, in a kind of way, or the anti-hero of the film, and he goes to visit you one day because you're in charge of the memory bank. The memory bank is called Zero, and you have an awful and peculiar experience with this memory bank called Zero. <laughs> If you haven't seen it before, are you critical of it in any way? No, I, no, I don't know. No, no, not at all, no. I mean, of your own performance, I don't mean the film. Well, I didn't see it. I know, I, I, have, to I have to tell you all, and the people who aren't watching, that in fact, throughout the entire time we were showing the clips, Ralph was lighting his pipe and not looking at himself as everyone else was. Oh, well. Well. <laughs> well. <laughs> You did, I don't know, they're always talking about oneself, uh, but you did ask me if I had other hobbies. I told you that I have my hobby of my motorbike, and I have my hobby of painting and drawing because my father was a painter, and my mother too. My mother grew up in the smell of turpentine, and I'm interested in one of two things. But what I love about my hobbies, which I really enjoy them so much, I get them as fairly tuned up and as know a bit about them as I can. It's so wonderful to have something that you don't have to do. It's a wonderful thing. I'm not going out painting today. I don't want to go out painting. And that is the joy, to have things that you don't really have to do in life. And the more you have, the more you enjoy not doing them. 
I see. Uh, you prose on lyrically about names. Names attract you a lot. Clocks attract you a lot. You have a lot of clocks in your house. Yes, I've got some clocks. Names but the names. Now you were saying this. Uh, does you say you don't like your name? You no. say you don't like yourself. No. Well, we agreed about that. I didn't that. say it like myself. Now hold on. No, you said no, you didn't like your face. Face. Well, we'll, we'll leave that. But what was interesting? You said you didn't like your name, right. Russell Harty. Funny, I think Russell Harty is a jolly decent name. Harty, do you mean that Harty, that you don't want to be labelled as a hearty man? But it could mean having heart. But uh, I, I looked up to see in Who's Who, and I saw that the, uh, Harty is a very rare name. The only two Harties I could find was a major general who lives in Dorsetshire and uh, a canon who lives in Cork. I wouldn't mind being either of those chaps. <laughs> <laughs> but um, now, Russell, you can't dislike Russell. I was very, I'm very fond of Russell because my, half my family are Russells. My mother was a Russell, and so I'm used, very used to the name. And I like it. And I don't mind Richardson. I think it rather suits me. But do we. Do uh, we... Because it's rather plain and rather, you know, Richardson. But the curious thing about names altogether, how weird it is how people's names sort of suit them. Do they get the name and grow up to be like it? Or how the labels of the famous people, what better name for our greatest writer, Shakespeare, than Shakespeare itself? Shakespeare, it seems to give you the feeling of so many things, of such a dramatic shaking aspect. It's not an exactly an aggressive word, but it's an arresting. You can see a man, Shakespeare. It's a long word. He, Shakespeare loved, loved long words. Now, Velasquez, how that suits that painter. Velasquez seems delicious. He puts his paint on, he enjoys putting it on. You feel you could eat the paint itself. Rembrandt, an old rumorative man, <laughs> drawing old things with long memories. Rembrandt, how that suits that painter. But isn't it curious? Conrad, how Conrad suit, how, Con, how it suit. Now, the most, the best fitting name, I should think, that I can remember, think of, is Bernard Shaw. Shavian, Shaw, witty. When he was young, he had a red beard. beard. Bernard, it seems red, red beard, Shavian is what absolutely puts him in a box, doesn't it? Have you been rehearsing all this? No, I, I, I thought of them on the way down. I thought of the chaps. Now, can you think well, of it? Well, yes, now, now, now you know why I don't like Harty. I mean, come on. If you go, Velasquez, Shakespeare, Shaw, Rembrandt, Harty. <laughs> I can't see there is a connotation of it, I suppose, from being a Harty man. Mm. But you're, you're not a Harty man in the backslapping sense at all. No. I think you're worrying about nothing. All right. I, think it's perfect. <laughs> I think he's perfectly all right. But you enjoy Richardson, though. It has a bit... I mean, don't mind. So, don't it, mind it. <clears throat> were you excited when you got a, a knighthood? Well... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yes, I, yes. I don't know. I'm, I'm not very... I'm not very... I don't know what to say about that much. Um, <laughs> but... <laughs> I tell you, I like the name Richardson. And I like the name <laughs> Russell. And what I'm particularly fond of, just by the, way, uh, by the way, I'm particularly fond of the name of the National Theatre. <laughs> Are you... You're how old? Seventy... what? Three? Me? Four? Seventy-three or four. Seventy-three or four. I always forget. Are you uh, uh, viewing the prospect of older age with regret or with happiness? I don't know. Very difficult to say. I can't have very... I don't think... I don't know... I don't feel... I don't think one ever does feel one's age. I'm so amazed to note that I'm as old as I am. I always had the idea, of course, we all had, that when I was young, I thought when I'm old, I'll get frightfully clever. I'll get awfully learned. I'll get jolly sage. People will come to me for advice, you know, when I get older. But nobody, I mean, I am pretty old, really, I suppose, but nobody ever comes to me for advice. <laughs> and I don't know a thing. But, um, no, I've got nothing to say about it, really. Thank goodness I've got my health pretty well. Are you, are you afraid of dying? No. 
no more than I, much nearer dying than I've ever been in my life. I've never been <laughs> particularly afraid of dying, not particularly, no. I wonder whether you had any intimations of mortality, for instance. We, we were talking uh, a week or two ago about how we both liked the period of the year that we're in, this... Ah, this the season of the year. Of the year. Yeah. And whether, in fact, ah, yes. you consider yourself to be in any autumn of your year. Yes, yes. Now, that, that reminds me, that we've come to the place that I've really brought my book of words, my laundry list, with me for. You remember when you came to me, you brought up the subject of autumn, and you quoted uh, some words of a favourite, one of my favourite poems, Keats' uh, poem to autumn, and you could remember the first line, and I could remember the last. Well, can you remember the line that you remember? I can remember exactly the line. What was, is, what was the is, line you remember? the first line of the Ode to Autumn, which is season of mist and mellow fruitfulness. Well done, well done. And I couldn't remember any more then, except just in the middle line. And I could remember the last line, and gathering swallows twitter in the sky. <laughs> so I thought, just for... It, it's just dead on the beginning of autumn now. I might, if you could stand it, just read the whole poem and it will refresh your memory. Mm. Shall we have a go? Which would be a fitting end to our programme. Could be, could be, could be, we'll try. Right. Come on now, ladies and gentlemen, nerve yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> you, it won't you, take very long. You want us to... I want, I want something to prop it on. Right. Have, yeah. Look, have you got a music stand? Well, well there, there, what's that thing there? It's not a music stand, it's a kind of stand. Will that do for yeah, you? That's fine. That's fine. All right. Right. Now. <clears throat> <clears throat> it begins, the Keats wrote to John Hamilton Reynolds on the 21st of September, 1819. How beautiful the season is now. How fine the air. A temperature and a sharpness about it. Really, without joking, chaste weather. Diane skies. I never liked stubble fields so much as now. I, better than the chilly green of the spring. Somehow a stubble plain looks warm in the same way that some pictures look warm. This struck me so much on my Sunday's walk that I composed on it. Season of mists and mellow fruitfulness, close bosom friend of the maturing sun, conspiring with him how to load and bless with fruit the vines that round the thatch eaves run to bend with apples the mossed cottage trees and fill all fruits with ripeness to the core, to swell the gourd and plump the hazel shells with a sweet kernel, to set budding more and still more later flowers for the bees until they think warm days will never cease, for summer has o'erbrimmed their clammy cells. Who hath not seen thee oft amid thy store? Sometimes whoever seeks abroad may find thee sitting careless on a granary floor, thy hair soft lifted by the winnowing wind. Or on a half-reaped furrow, sound asleep, drowned with the fume of poppies, while thy hook spares the next swath and all its twined flowers. And sometimes, like a gleaner, thou dost keep steady thy laden head across a brook, or by a cider press, with patient look, thou watchest the last oozings, hours by hours. Where are the songs of spring? Aye, where are they? Think now, not of them, thou hast thy music too. While barred clouds bloom the soft dying day and touch the stubble plains with rosy hue, then in a wailful choir the small gnats mourn along the river shadows, borne aloft or sinking as the light wind lives or dies. And full-grown lambs loud bleat from hilly born, hedge crickets sing, and now with treble soft the red breast whistles from the garden croft, and gathering swallows twitter in the skies. Well, that's all, ladies and gentlemen. And so now, with all wishing you all the compliments of the season of autumn, thank you very much indeed for letting me come here.
and good night. Well, Fritz.